Hey, thanks for joining us online today. We believe that Jesus wants to do so much through you and for you, and we'd love to hear about how he's working in your life. Please take a second to email your story to stories at rise-church.com. We hope this message leaves you feeling uplifted and encouraged. Enjoy. My name is Adam. I have the great honor of being the lead pastor of this church. And today I am honored to share the stage with, get this, my brother from the same mother. Come on, y'all give it up for my brother, Philip. My older brother, my far less attractive older brother. I just, my brother and I have, um, He's two years older than me, and uh, it's, I've had the privilege of having a front row seat to seeing God transform his life, and not just his life, but his family's life. Um, they started the church with us, and what God has done in them and through them, and, and the, we, uh, we hired his wife, and, and uh, we're trying to hire him, and uh, uh, he has a really good job, though, so... Uh, but I, I'm excited to share the stage with him today, and uh, I threw this idea out to him a while back, and he said yes, and, and so uh, it's gone pretty good the first two services, so we're going to try it one more time. What do you say? And uh, I'm excited. Here we go. We are in week three. If you are a first-time guest, welcome. Thanks for being here today. We're in week three of a series that we kicked off two weeks ago called Cow Tipping, and uh, we're a church on the west side, so every once in a while, you just have to embrace it and go full-on redneck, and uh, through this series, we're trying to have some fun with it where we are pushing over the lies that we believe about church and Christianity and God, and, and I brought my brother up here today, and uh, before we jump into the message, though, I promised you something week one of this series, and if I make a promise, I come through on it. Uh, um, I promised you a cheesy cow joke every week of this series, and they have not been good by any standard, uh, but they have been cheesy, and you've laughed a little bit at some of them. And with Philip being up here today, he said, I have a cow joke. And I said, well, that's not really your thing. That's my thing. Uh, But his cow... His joke's pretty good. Uh, I may say it might be better than mine. It definitely has gotten more laughs. So I I thought about me telling my joke first and then you doing yours, but I'm not going to do that because I still think mine's better down deep. So go ahead and share yours with them this morning. All right. So what do you call a cow with a twitch? (laughs) That's not the punchline. That's not the joke. Beef jerky. (laughs) Beef jerky. That's pretty good. That's pretty, I love beef jerky, so that's a great joke. Okay. Um, so mine's a knock-knock joke. You may have heard it, so don't, don't ruin the punchline for anybody else. So, but help me out. Knock-knock. Yeah. Interrupting cow. Yeah. Moo! <laughs> you get it? Because he interrupted you? You'll get it in a few. You're going to listen. You didn't laugh at that, but you're going to use that joke later on today. And you're, you're not even going to give me credit for that. So, awesome. Hey. Listen, uh, next week we're closing this series out, and um, it it will be the last week of the cheesy cow jokes. I know, I know. We may bring them back for the next series, but probably not. We're probably just going to bury these bad boys. (laughs) Hey, listen, uh, we're going to push over a lie today, a a lie that many of you uh, possibly believe still or at one point believed, and uh, this lie is so big I had to bring back up um, because this is the the lie we're pushing over today, the, the ridiculous lie that the church, get this, just wants my money. And if you call Rise Church home, hopefully you already know our heart on this. If you're a first-time guest, you're thinking right now, are you kidding me, bro? My first week to your church and it's a finance sermon? Yes, I am. We're doing it. We're going for it. And this is a perfect opportunity for you to hear our heart. Because odds are you've been a part of a church in the past that made you feel guilt and shame into giving, and that's just not who we are. Um, I have some friends of mine that'll preach a five-week series on giving. Um, We've never done that, uh, partially because I don't think I could come up with five weeks of new material. I feel like I just keep saying the same thing over and over. And and really, um, when it comes down to it, we preach on giving at least two times a year, sometimes three. And and the reason we don't have to preach on it out of a state of, like, please give is because Rush Church is full of generous people that already do it, and so we're just going to speak into that a little bit more. If you don't give to our church and you don't give to anything or whatever, um, this sermon might not do anything for you. Um, I pray what it does do is, is point you to Jesus and you understand what giving is, but if you love to give, um, you're going to leave encouraged. Um, I love to give. 
So I'm excited about preaching this today. In the early days of the church, I didn't really like preaching on giving because we wanted people to come. And if you preach on giving, sometimes people won't, don't come back. And, um, but I don't care anymore because people are coming and, and we want to see you set free in this area of your life like we want to see you set free in every area of your life. And so I love to give. I have a goal to be the top giver at Rise Church. I don't make as much money as some of you, but I'm coming after you anyways. I want to lead the way in generosity at this church and I want to pastor people that are generous. And I didn't get a lot of amens from that, but I'm just going to assume that you amended it in your heart. And um, if you amended it in your heart, then let it go. Let's go. And I just want to remind you that, that what you're sitting in right now is um, because of generosity. The, the very building that you're sitting in. And I hit on this last week, but if you weren't here, let me just get you caught up. This building that you're sitting in belonged to a church called Macedonia Baptist Church. And at one point... God was, was blessing them, but they went through some transition and, and they got to a place where they didn't have a pastor and they weren't sure what to do. And they reached out to a young pastor in a young church and said, we think God's doing something pretty awesome in your church and we want to be a part of it. And because they gave, they literally gave us this building, we have been able to come in here and look what God has done because of people's generosity. The chair that you're sitting in right now is because somebody bought this chair. We did a chair campaign in the early days when we were at Eagles View Academy because the chairs that we were sitting in were hot garbage, okay? There was, there was like an eclectic, like there was like four or five different chairs. We had really nice ones that were black metal chairs, but they had a green cushion on them. And we tried to save them for our first time guests, but everybody wanted to sit in the nice chairs and, and we hated you for that. It's the equivalent of y'all ripping the tape here at... at at this building. And then we had these brown metal chairs with like a brown cushion, and most of those were ripped. And then we had just straight metal, and then we had just straight broken. Like there was like a leg missing or, or part, you know, bolts were falling off and it was terrible. And so we just did a campaign and we said, hey, um, we called it buy someone else's chair. Brilliant. I came up with it. And the whole purpose was this. Um, we don't want you to buy your chair. We want you to buy a chair of somebody that doesn't come to our church yet. Somebody that's broken and hurting and possibly doesn't know Jesus yet. We want you to buy their chair so that when they come, they have a nice cushiony chair to sit in to hear the greatest message ever preached. And these are the same chairs that we've been rocking for four years. We've been thinking about getting new ones. We're thinking about recliners with a cup holder, seat warmers. I don't know. We'll see. But the, the, these, are, these, these are the chairs that, that somebody else purchased. Maybe, maybe it was you that had been coming for a while. Um, in the early days, we had 11 people in my living room. And um, in our first meeting ever, we, we took up an offering, but we didn't have any money yet because we just started. And so we needed a, a bucket or a plate to pe take up the offering. And so I drove through um, a KFC. And uh, it was my idea. And I just said, um, hey, ma'am, I need a bucket. And the lady said, well, how many pieces of chicken do you want? I said, no, you misunderstood me. I don't want any chicken. I just want the bucket. And the lady was like, looked at me, you know, like confused. And, and, uh, and I said, I explained it to her. We're a new church and we're going to take up an offering, but we don't have any money. I just need a bucket to take up the offering. And the lady was like, you poor soul. And uh, she gave me the bucket and even dropped a couple pieces of chicken in, you know, like, would help this brother out. And, um, and so we took up our first offering in a KFC bucket and we kind of had some fun with it and we still do from time to time. And I just kept telling everybody that KFC stands for keep it freaking coming. And uh, because, you know, raise some money up in here. Uh, but it, it's been so cool to, to see God to move in our church. And, and I just want to push this lie over right off the very beginning because if you're sitting out there going, um, well, it's a money talk, so obviously you want our money. Um, we don't. Now, that's not the mission of our church. The mission of Rise Church isn't to get your money. Uh, the mission of Rise Church is for, you to, uh, for us to lead you to love God with all your heart. Amen. We want to see you love God with all of your heart, and, and we know that money is attached to that. And so if God has your heart, then he has your finances, and we want to lead you to that. And um, if you don't give in this church, um, there's no condemnation. We don't have a list up in the office of like, this is the bad people. They don't give anything. Oh, can you believe them? No, 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 we don't do that. There's no condemnation, but there's always an invitation to partner with what God is doing here and to really trust God with your finances. And I brought my brother up here because he's been a part of our finance team from day one, and um, he has seen the generosity grow in our church, and so I wanted him to share a little bit about that. Yeah, when we uh, first started out, <clears throat> we, I can remember sitting at my dining room table one evening, um, and we were 
preparing the IRS forms to become a tax-exempt organization, and one of the things that they require is projecting the next three years of revenues. And, you know, we're, we're 11 people who are meeting once a week, taking up KFC offerings. And I looked at Pastor Ryan and said, what do you want to put down here? And he goes, let's do $80,000. I was like, 11 people, that math doesn't work. Um, but God provided. Yeah. Not that $80,000 was some magical number, but just the fact that we, we had set this, what I thought was absolutely ridiculous number to be collected within a year, and God surpassed that. And, and that was just a testimony of what he was going to continue to do yeah. through the people who called Rise Church their home. Because each year, we set a budget, and our, our staff sticks to that budget, but we, we collect way more than what is necessary to operate this church. And that's only because of your generosity. Yeah. So that's been awesome to see. You know, Pastor Adam mentioned uh, Macedonia giving us the building. They gave us the building, and it had a small mortgage, nowhere near what if we were trying to buy this piece of property, what it would, what it would cost. But they had a small, small mortgage on the property, and um, the bank that the mortgage was with was unwilling just to waive it for us. I don't get that. I mean, they should have just waived the mortgage and sucked it up and you know, written it off or something. But um, the, the, when we were trying to get a loan, because we had to take on that loan, most banks didn't want to deal with an organization, especially a church that was only two and a half years old. And they just said, no, we don't do, we don't do that. Go talk to somebody else. Once, once we eventually found a bank that was willing to talk to us, they were crazy impressed with the amount of offerings that we had collected in two and a half years and what we had been able to set aside as a savings account. And it was only because of the generosity of the yeah. people of the church. Yep. And then we operated the thing on a shoestring budget. Like, literally. Literally, we, we would use shoestrings to, <laughs> to tie stuff together. But it, it was what we had to do early on. But the people of Rise Church who, who called the church their home at the time were just crazy generous. And then even as a, as a member of the finance team, I get to look at um, weekly offerings to make sure that we're on, on track to meet budget and that we're, we're covering our expenses. But then also we have plans for way down the road of, of what God wants to do through the church. Yeah. So like saying, how, you know, how close are we to, to reaching that next plateau of, of we can pursue this plan? And it's, it's been awesome to see individual families and individuals who, who started out giving maybe it was 20 bucks every once in a while. And then that 20 bucks every once in a while became 20 bucks a week. And that 20 bucks a week became 50 bucks a week and 100 bucks a week. And not that the amount matters, but the, the fact that their heart was changing and yeah. that, that, that they were surrendering so an good. area of their life to God and just saying, God, I trust you. I'm putting my faith in you that you're going to provide to me. So that's been awesome to see over the last five years. And so what we want to do today, yeah, you can clap all day. Listen. What we want to do is just kind of break down three points today for you and just kind of walk through just uh, what God put on our heart. And the first one is this, that, that finances, when we break it all down, they are an issue of the heart and obedience. Now, when I shared with you that today was a finance message, nobody got up on their chair and started going, yes, I've been waiting for this one all year. Like, no, you didn't do that, right? Okay, but everything else in the church can excite us, so finances need to excite us. And when it comes down to it, it, it really is an issue of of the heart and do we trust God with our finances? I love how Proverbs 3 5 says this trust in the Lord, say it with me, all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And so, in every area of our lives, we want to learn to trust God. That includes our finances. But the majority of people in the world today do not trust God with their finances. They don't even give anything to God and they live only for themselves. Here's a couple pictures I want to share with you. The majority of people spend about 90 to 95 percent of their money on themselves and that's what they live for. If they have five to ten percent, maybe less than that. They'll put it into some type of savings and then whatever they have left over, that's what they'll give. And so if you've ever been in church before and you don't really, you didn't maybe come prepared to give and you feel guilty when the buckets are being passed, that's when you'll open your wallet and you'll see a five, a 10 or a 20. And then you're like, Which, do I give the five, the 10 or the 20? And if you feel really guilty, you'll give the 20. If you're like, yeah, I'm okay today, you'll drop in the, and, and, and that's how we give because we give what's left over. And that is a very me-centered way of living. God has a different way for us to live, and it's a, it's a godly way. And first and foremost, we're called to, to give to God, to trust Him with our first. So we give to God, and we'll talk about this word tithe in just a little bit. It's 10%. 
And then we're called to, to save. Listen, some of you can't give over here in this one because you're not just living off a of 90 to 95% of your income. You're living off of 110% of your income because you're in debt because of credit cards. You prayed, God, please provide a miracle. And then that credit card came in the mail, pre-approved, $5,000. You're like, this is God. He, he provided. No, that's the devil, okay? That is not your money. You can't live off of it. The interest rate, oh, but the interest rate's only 1.9%. Yeah, but then it jumps to 15.3,000%. And now you're in debt because of that? We, we offer a financial peace um, small group here, which is really all about getting out of debt and, and getting freed up in your finances. And some of you, you don't have peace in your finances right now. You need to get into that small group. There are so many people in our church that have gone through it and they are getting out of debt and they're putting money in savings. Come on, it's freeing them up and now they can give. Some of you, you want to give in our church or you want to give, but you don't have the money because you haven't reprioritized your giving and your living. And so when it comes down to it, we want to learn to give first, then we want to save, and then we want to live off of the rest. It's called the 10-10-80 rule. We're going to give 10% to God through the church. We're going to save 10%. I'm not there yet. I'm trying to get better at the savings. And then we're going to live off of the rest. The result is a godly way of living. But many of us have the wrong grip on our finances. I played baseball growing up. I was pretty good. I was better than my brother. And so we would play baseball and, and I, I, I could swing as hard as I wanted to. And, and every once in a while I could hit the ball pretty far. My dad loved golf and he would take my brother and I to go golfing. And my brother was better at me than golf. And it drove me crazy because I wanted to beat him at everything. You know what I'm saying? He's your brother. You don't want him to beat you at anything. Because then he would brag and rub it in and I hated him for it. But now I, I've forgiven him. Here's the problem. Here's the problem with my golf swing. I had the wrong grip. I gripped it like a baseball bat and I'd just swing as hard as I could and it would never go straight. It'd always just shoot to the right. I didn't realize until later in my 20s, uh, later 20s, I had the wrong grip. When you're holding a golf club, you don't hold it like a baseball bat. You take the pinky and you take the pointer finger and you interlock them together and it allows you to hold the golf club in a better way to where you still don't hit the ball completely straight, but a little bit straighter. You know what I'm saying? I had the wrong grip, but here's the problem. I had gripped it like this for so long that holding it like this just felt completely uncomfortable. Some of you have gripped your money in a way that to re-grip it the way that God wants you to is going to feel a little uncomfortable. But that's what God's calling you to do. See, many of us are walking around like this. This is my money. I worked hard for this. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. Well, if you have that mentality, your hands are never going to be open to receive the blessing that God wants to pour out on you. But if you can hold your hands open like this and say, everything I have is from you, God. The job I have, you provided for me. Heck, the breath I have in my lungs to live, to go work that job is all from you. So I'm going to hold it like this and thank you for everything you've given me. And if you want to use it over here, you can. And God, also, now I'm ready to receive whatever it is that you want to put into my life. Malachi 3.10 is a very famous verse in the Old Testament that talks about this word tithe. It's not a popular word in the church. I think the church has abused it to an extent, but when it comes down to it, the tithe is 10%. Whatever you make, 10%. This is an easy one, okay? Everybody should get this. My 10-year-old on the way to church was like, Dad, what are you preaching on today? I told him I'm preaching on giving. I'm preaching on the tithe. What's the tithe? 10%. Oh, so if I had 10 pennies, I give one penny to God? Yes, he's 10. You should get it. <laughs> and in Malachi 3.10, it says this. Hey, bring the whole tithe. Not part of it, the whole tithe, the tenth, to the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. It's the one thing in the Bible where God looks down and says, try me. Test me. Watch and see if I don't provide for you. Watch and see if I'm not faithful. Test me, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not open, throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Come on, 10%. Trust God. Test him and see what he'll do. Come on, let's regrip our finances today and watch God move in a mighty way. Yeah, sometimes I think Satan, well, not sometimes, I think all times, Satan likes to use money to distract us or to keep us from actively and, and wholeheartedly pursuing after God. Because money is something that we can see. Like, we can put our hands on it. I know what 20 bucks is going to buy. If I, if I have $8.99, I know that I can go get a dozen Krispy Kreme glazed donuts, right? Money is something that we, we, we think is ours. And, and in reality, it's something that God has given to us. Right. And so, when we think about giving, or when we actually give, we are breaking the hold that Satan tries to bind us That's with. Good. 
When, when, we, when we give to God and say, God, I'm trusting you with this. I'm giving back to you what you've already given to me. We, we are kind of cutting that cord that Satan has tried to wrap around our ankles to keep us back from fully pursuing after God because giving is an act of obedience. So let's look at Matthew 6, verse 19. Jesus is speaking here. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Yeah. The, the message says it's the, this way. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place where you will most want to be and end up being. So where we spend our money, where we invest our money, where we, where we designate our money is where our treasure is. Now, that's not to say that we, we are not to buy stuff or have possessions or anything like that, because I b- truly believe that God blesses us with many, many things. But if that's the focus of all of our money, if that's the focus of what we're doing in this life, that's our treasure. And so to give, you have to be intentional about it. Yeah. It doesn't just happen. You have, to, you have to walk in here on a Sunday morning or, or log into the app, and you have, to, you have to intentionally decide in your mind that I'm giving back to God what He has already blessed me with. And that's why you hear us talk about online giving. Um, Online giving is kind of the greatest creation, in my opinion. Not the greatest, but it's a great creation. Uh, because it allows us to automate our giving. It allows you to set up recurring giving just like you would write a check every two weeks if you get paid every two weeks or once a month if you get paid monthly. Recurring giving allows you to automate a, an obedient factor in your Christian walk. You can't automate prayer. You can't automate reading the Bible. We can't automate sharing the gospel. Those are all things that we have to make daily and hourly decisions on, but I can automate my giving. Yeah, y'all remember the 90s infomercial where the guy had uh, the, the rotisserie chicken thing, and he would say, just set it and forget it. Online giving and recurring giving is almost like setting it and forgetting it. Mm-hmm. You set it, and it's done until you go in and change it or cancel it. It's going to keep happening at the frequency in which you choose. But you don't forget it because you still get an email reminder two days before the the, the giving is going to process. And I take that email reminder, and that's the chance that I get to go, God, thank you that that I'm able to give, that I'm giving back to you what you have given to me. And then secondly, that take this gift and use it to bless someone, use it to change this community, use it for however you see fit. And he will do that. So, so we have to be intentional about our Absolutely. Giving. And I love the online giving because we set ours and our family to come out the first of the month. And so we get paid monthly the first of the month, and we set the giving to come out the first of the month, meaning this, God, I'm giving you my first, and I'm giving you my best, and then I'm going to have to live off of the rest. And so if I make unwise decisions, then I'm not going to have any money at the end of the month. But God, I've given you this first and foremost. And I can understand that some of you are like, well, it doesn't sound very spiritual to give online. No, it's super spiritual. It's super spiritual because you're prioritizing it and saying, I'm intentional about this and God, it's coming out the first. I'm not waiting to write that check. And if you want to give here on church on a Sunday morning, like go for it. I'm not bashing you for that. Like do whatever God calls you to do. But I'm telling you, man, when I see that come out, I'm just like, yes, God, there you go. It's my first, and it's my best, and I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to reprioritize some of my stuff and eating out and and anything else that I spend my money on because I'm going to give you that, and I'm going to live off of the rest. Now, some of you, I think 60 to 70% of our church gives online, which is really cool. And so I get it. When we pass the buckets on Sunday morning, you already have given online. And so, but, but, but that person that's sitting beside you doesn't know that. So you might have like the feeling of like when the bucket hits you, like whispering to them, like, hey, I already gave online. It's cool. Like, don't, <laughs> don't judge me, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, th- nobody's judging you for anything. And so just, just be aware of, of that. Um, point number two that I want to share today is this, that, that we want to be generous because Jesus was generous, because Jesus gave. We, we want to have a reputation of generosity, that if Rise Church all of a sudden was plucked out of the west side of Jacksonville and moved to another part of our city or another state, that the people in this community would, would miss us and go, man, they, they were a generous church, and you are a part of a generous church. 
Ask, ask any three of our local partner schools. Tell them that you go to Rise Church and they're going to smile and go, oh my gosh, thank you so much for what you do for us. And I feel like what we've done for them is just a little bit and we're just getting started. We want to build a reputation of generosity in this community. In the book of Mark chapter 14, Jesus is eating at somebody's house. He's having a meal, and this woman comes in. And the Bible doesn't tell us what her name was in Mark, but it says that she comes in, and she takes this jar of perfume, and she breaks it, and that she pours it all over Jesus' head. It, it, it was her anointing him and showing worth to him. Um, something fun that I used to do with my brother when we were younger, and we would walk around like the Avenues Mall or Orange Park Mall when people used to do that, and uh, department stores and stuff, we'd be in something like and I would grab women's perfume. And when he wasn't looking, he'd walk by and I'd just spray him with it like a ton. You should try that. It's, re- it's hilarious. They would love it. And then he'd chase me around Dillard's and my mom would yell at us. Good memories. Good times. <laughs> That's what this woman did. She comes in while Jesus is eating at this house and she takes this, this jar of perfume and she breaks it and pours it over him. And this wasn't a normal jar of perfume. This wasn't Tommy Girl or whatever you ladies used to rock back in the early 90s and 80s. Anybody wear Tommy Girl? Anybody? Clinique? Happy? Anybody? Okay, awesome. Hey, listen. (laughs) Um, It says this jar of perfume was a year's wage. Think about that for a moment. Think about taking your salary for this year and just going, here you go, God. Now, God's not asking that from you. He asked for a tenth, the tithe, 10%. That's why when you come here on a Sunday morning, you don't have to guess Well, what should we give this week, honey? Should we give $20? Should we give $100? Should we? No, 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 no. Calculate your earnings and 10% it. And that's what God is asking of you. And that doesn't make any sense. You're telling me, God, I got to give 10%? And yeah, well, let me remind you, you wouldn't have the 100 if it weren't for him. And he wants you to be able to step into that so that you can take what you have and you can give it away so that God can use it so that we can grow, not just in this church, but in your life so that you can have a reputation of generosity. I think down deep, we all want to be generous. We just have to be intentional and say, okay, we're actually going to do it. We're going to reprioritize some stuff in our lives and we are going to live out this generosity because, get this, we serve the most generous God in the world. He gave his son Jesus for us. Come on, somebody. Let's go. Go ahead. Well, actually, no, I got one more verse to share. Listen, this is what the Bible says about this woman. Mark 14, 9. It says this, that wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Here we are, 2,000 plus years later, still talking about this woman. That's a reputation of generosity. And that's what we want. Now you can go. Thanks. I yeah. still smell like it. It feels so good when you can tell your other brother what to do. Come on. I love it. <laughs> you know, um, Jesus was the ultimate giver, right? Yeah. So good. I mean, that he gave his life, that he saw me and you at our absolute worst yes. and said, I'm willing to pay the ultimate price Amen. for them so that they can be rescued. So we want to be ge- generous because Jesus was generous. And he wasn't only generous with his life, but he was generous with his time. I mean, he. Think about all the people that he continually interacted with yeah. that, you know, if he was on his way to the temple to, to worship, that he would stop and heal someone. And, and, and I want to look at a specific story in Matthew 14. Verse 13 says, when Jesus heard about what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. So real quick, Jesus, one of Jesus' best friends, John the Baptist, just passed away. Passed is a rather loose term. He got beheaded. And so he's lost his life. He's lost one of his best friends, and he just wants to get away to mourn the loss of his friends. And I think sometimes we forget that Jesus was just as much person as we are. Like, we see him sitting up in heaven on his throne, which he is, and he is a holy God. But at the same time, he experienced the same pain, the same loss, the same agony that you and I experience And he still meets us right where we are because he knows exactly what we're going through. But so he's he's trying to escape to get alone just to just to spend some time to mourn the loss of of his friend. And it says, hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the town. And when Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. So they they beat him to the other side of the lake, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. 
So at a moment when he was going just to spend some alone time, the crowd showed up and he healed their sick. He didn't say, hey guys, can we just do this tomorrow? I, I just, just need some time. No, he gave. Yeah. He was generous with his time. And then as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. I love Jesus' response. He says, they do not need to go away. You give them something to yeah. eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish. And if you don't know the rest of the story, he takes those five loaves of bread and two fish and he feeds 5,000 men. That doesn't include the women and children there. So there was probably 10 to 15,000 people that he fed with just five loaves of bread and two fish. And he did that because someone made what they had available. Yeah. So you and I, we've been blessed with what God has given us. When we give it back to him, we're making what we have available to him so that he can multiply it, so he can use it, and so that he can pour back into this community, into the lives of the people that he wants to forever change when we make ourselves available. Absolutely. I think there, there's, there's, there's a lie. There's a gospel out there in the world today that's called the prosperity gospel. There's actually two gospels. Let me explain them to you real quick. And there's a, then there's the one true one. So there's the prosperity gospel that God just wants to pour out blessings on you so that you have more. And then there's another gospel on the tail end over here that says, no, no, you're supposed to be poor. You're supposed to just walk around with nothing. No, 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 no. I think there's a happy place in the middle. And this is what I believe because the Bible backs this up constantly, that God does want to bless you, but not so you have more, so that you have more to give away. You understand that? God wants to pour out blessings on you, not for you to keep for yourself so that you can give a more away. So if you get a job raised, that is a blessing from God so that you can give more away. And we have to get to a place where we realize that everything we have is from God. And so point number three, let's use it to make a difference. God, I want my money to be greater than just living for myself. I want my finances to be used to make a difference. For the past few years at our church, we've partnered with Operation Christmas Child, where we have filled shoeboxes with toys and stuff that we send overseas to other countries to children for Christmas. And uh, as, a, as a whole, our church isn't doing it, but Rise Kids is taking it on as their ministry this year. And if you want to partner with them, you can grab a shoebox on your way out, fill it up. They're kind of doing things a little bit different, but if you want to be a part of that, go for it. So many of you have wrote in and said, um, hey, how do we help with the hurricane relief? You already did. You're giving. We don't have to do a special, we're not passing buckets. Hey, we need to do a special hurricane offering. What you gave, we already gave. So when Hurricane Florence hit the Carolinas because of your generosity, we sent money already to partner churches that we know up there so that they can help out boots on the ground. When the Michael hit the panhandle, we already sent money to partner churches over there so that they can be there. We, we minister and partner with an organization called Convoy of Hope, which has been doing this for hundreds of years. We don't have to create a new ministry. They're already doing it in Jesus' name. So if you want to give to the hurricane relief, call Red Cross, find somebody else, whatever. But if you give to Rise Church, you already helped with the hurricane relief. Listen, you, we took up a Christmas offering, $20,000, $25,000 last year. We sent it all to Africa, and they built a church. We operate off of the 10, 10, 80 at our church. We we, we give away 10% of everything that comes in. How much are we going to bring in this year? $900,000. 900 stinking thousand dollars. You, collectively, not one person wrote a check like 900 grand. Here you go. All of us collectively. If you haven't given to our church, you're not a part of that yet. That's no condemnation and invitation. Join in. So 10% we're going to take, and we always give more than 10%, so it'll be closer to 100000 that we'll just give away immediately. And then we're going to save ninety dollars to $100,000 this year because our church is growing and we're going to need a bigger building at some point or another building or something. I don't know. And then we operate off of the 80. And honestly, we really operate off of 60. We really do. I have amazing staff. They don't get paid hardly enough. We, we keep budget low. And the reality, it comes down to this, like, 
We just want to use our money to make a difference in people's lives. God, would you, would you take what you have blessed us with? Because we are blessed. And would you allow us to make a difference in other people's lives? Yeah, so when you, when you want to see a difference made or you want to see something succeed, you, you invest in that with your time, your resources. So think about your kids, um, their after-school activities, maybe sports or their education. You, you invest in them. Maybe it's your marriage that you invest in with a date night or, or going away on trips together. Or, or, or maybe it's yourself and your career with investing in additional certifications or, or training to make yourself a better employee to move up. There's nothing wrong with investing. We're just inviting you to invest into this place. Yeah. Because to be able to write a check for $20,000 to send to, to our missionary partners in Africa so that they can buy land and build a church is one thing. But then when we get to heaven and someone walks up to you and says, thank you for giving to Rise Church. Because of you, I came to know Jesus. Yeah. That's the best investment you can make. There's no portfolio. There's no stock you can buy. There's no CD certificate of deposit in case anyone was thinking compact disc. There's nothing you can buy on this earth that is in better investment than eternity. Amen. Amen. So let's just put a bow on this today. Because when it comes to giving, people don't understand that. And there's a lot of things in the church that don't make sense. You ever talk to one of your lost friends and you tell them that you come to church on Sunday morning and they're like, so you go to, go to church on your day off? You wake up and you go to church on your day off? Some of you, you're so crazy and I love you so much because you're incredible. You're not just sitting this service. You've already been serving the other services that we had this morning. Y'all are awesome. So you'll not just give one hour, you'll give countless hours on a Sunday morning, your day off. Some of you, when you gather in this place during the music time, during the, the worship through the music, you lift your hands in the air. And for some of y'all, that doesn't make any sense. You're like, what, is somebody holding a gun up to you? Like, you got a, you got a question you want to ask right now? Giving doesn't make sense. Your heart will say, step out in faith, trust God, he'll provide. Your mind will say, that doesn't compute because if you give 10%, then we're not going to be able to take these multiple trips to Disney and that car that we want and blah, 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 blah. It doesn't make any sense. But the life that Jesus gave on the cross didn't make sense either, but he gave it. He gave it. In closing, Mark chapter 14, it tells us that Jesus was eating at a house. It doesn't tell us whose house, and it doesn't tell us the name of this lady. But in John chapter 12, we get a little more detail. It's the same story. And we find out that Jesus is eating at a guy's house named Lazarus. And the girl that broke the perfume, her name was Mary. And Mary was the sister of Lazarus. Now, if you grew up in church, you know Lazarus. If you didn't grow up in church, let me tell you about your boy Lazarus. He died. He died dead. He was super sick. They sent word to Jesus. They said, hey, the one you love, this guy, your friend Lazarus, he's sick. Jesus said, I'll be there when I get there. He waited a few days. And by the time he showed up, Lazarus was dead. Mary sees him coming, walks out. She's ticked. Jesus, if you would have been here, Lazarus, my brother, wouldn't have died. Jesus says, Mary, do you trust me? Yeah, I trust you. I know he'll raise again one day. Jesus says, I am the resurrection, meaning right now we're going to do this thing. He calls out, Lazarus, Lazarus, get your stinky butt out. Lazarus comes walking out in mummy clothes, smelling bad. And in John chapter 12, Jesus sits down and eats a meal at Lazarus' house. And here comes Mary. Tell your neighbor there's something about Mary. Here comes Mary. And she breaks open this jar of perfume and she pours it out on Jesus. A year's wage. Why did she do it? Why did she do that to Jesus? Because Jesus had done something incredible in the life of somebody that she loved. Mary saw something dead 
come to life. You want to talk about a return on your investment? You want to talk about making a difference with your finances? What God is doing at Rise Church is incredible. And every single week, we are seeing dead people who are stuck in sin come to life through Jesus. And this is why we give. Because we trust you, God. Because we want our money to make a difference. And because we want to have a reputation of generosity. Thanks for watching today. If you'd like to continue the conversation, you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram. If our church has had an impact on you and you'd like to support what Jesus is doing here, you can do so by going to rise-church.com slash give and select the giving option that best suits you. Thanks for watching online and have a great week.